Well, thank you all for still being here for yet another Buffalo talk. But, you know, Buffalo and FMD are fascinating, so we all appreciate that, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> so my talk will sort of attempt to um, pull together some of the data that we've generated with our cohort and experimental studies and then use models to apply that and see what this all means for disease dynamics. However, right now our model is about acute tra transmission during acute infection only, so there's nothing in there yet about carriers and what transmission from carriers might add to these dynamics. Aha. Uh -huh. So you've heard plenty about African buffalo. The take home message about why we care about buffalo is that they are sort of at this intersection where they're an ecologically and economically very important species in savanna ecosystems and in um, southern African um, parks. But at the same time, they carry many important disease, diseases, including FMD. So they uh, are at this sort of crossroads uh, that often causes conflict between conservation interests on the one hand and agricultural interests at the other, on the other hand. So um, the other piece there of the study system, of course, FMDV and African buffalo, these three points here Bree just talked about um, <clears throat> and others before her. So FMD causes mild or no lesions in buffalo. Um, they are viremic for about a week and they have strong inflammatory responses to infection. Um, they seroconvert by day 14 and we presume they have lasting immune responses. <laughs> so what does that mean for transmission then? Well, we also know that transmission of FMDV is efficient in buffalo, um, and I think Catherine mentioned that in her talk also, that by one or two years of age, if you catch a buffalo in the wild, um, it will be seropositive to all three um, sat types in the Kruger National Park and other places too. Um, so uh, we also know that many buffalo carry viable foot and mouth disease virus um, for months to years, but the role of these uh, carriers and transmission is, is unclear. So if we have this quick transmission, very efficient transmission in Buffalo and lasting immunity, then um, that sort of begs the question whether that's a problem for disease persistence from year to year in these herds, because you might expect that if you have very fast transmission, a high R naught of the pathogen, that you would quickly run out of susceptible animals um, and that the disease would have difficulty persisting in the long run, particularly in smaller populations. So to investigate that, um, we made a mathematical model, and by we, I mean um, Aaron Gorsuch, our theory postdoc, and Jan Medlock, our theory collaborator, who's also in the audience, and if the model seems strange, you can ask him directly after the talk. Um, but uh, as I said, we don't have carriers in this model yet, so the classes that we do have there does this have a pointer? Yes, okay. Uh, maternally protected animals um, that then when maternal antibodies wane can enter the susceptible class. Uh, transmission can then occur and the animals become exposed. Um, progression leads into the infectious group. Uh, those then recover quite quickly into the rec recovered group uh, from which they don't return to the susceptible group, we think. At least in our model, we have not put that in. Um, and obviously, buffalo can die out of all of these classes. Um, <clears throat> so what we did now was parameterize this initial model from the cohort, cohort and exp experimental studies that we've done so far. So a very key parameter in this model is the um, timing of, of birth, births in African buffalo. And fortunately, that has been um, described really nicely by a previous study by Sadie Ryan, who worked in Klesiri Reserve, which is one of the private reserves right outside Kruger National Park. So it's very close to where we work. It's, it's outside the central Kruger. Um, <clears throat> and what Sadie shows here is um, the, the light bars are buffalo births and the dark bars uh, are NDVI, or greenness of the environment. And this is a nice eight-year data set with monthly resolution um, of buffalo births. And so what you can see is a couple of points here. So buffalo births coincide really quite tightly um, with maximum greenness in the environment. So buffalo have their babies when there's good food around. This makes sense. Um, what you can also see, particularly here when you summarize these data um, into uh, average births per month over the year, uh, taking all these eight years into account, is that you have a, a fairly tight birth pulse that is centered around these wet season months. So from December to April, most of the births occur, and very few births occur 
between May or June and then um, November. So most births between December and April means that there's a gap in the birth pulse of about five or six months when there's very few new animals being born. And so for any acute infection that moves through a cohort of susceptible <laughs> animals quickly, um, this birth gap is what it needs to bridge every year to persist in that population in the long term. So how do we use birth data? Um, <clears throat> well, we're currently using data from our cohort study um, in our enclosed area where we've been measuring births with an accuracy of plus or minus two weeks, we think, <laughs> um, <clears throat> because our buffalo are captured every two or three months. Um, so what I'm showing here is an example of the 2014-15 birth cohort um, broken up by months and then the number of births are plotted here. So what we can do with these data is, is fit a curve, that's the red dots, um, to our birth data. And we can then define our birth peak when that fell. In this case, it was in January. We can also define the width of that birth interval, so the variation that we had that year in birth timing in our herd. And that width then also you know, defines the gap that, that would uh, happen between that birth cohort and the next birth cohort. So by using multiple years, we can put, then put variance on these parameters um, to use in our models. We can then, in the model, simulate births um, by varying the timing of the peak and the spread of the distribution um, according to the observed parameters. We can also go outside that observed range and ask what if questions. If we had a longer birth pulse, um, what would happen to dynamics or a short, shorter birth pulse? And so we've been approximating the birth pulse with a, a triangle function here. So that graph just shows uh, time on the x-axis and then the probability of giving birth on the y-axis. Um, the, the advantage of this function is that we can have a proper gap in between these peaks, which is much harder to do when you use a nice smooth sine or cosine function. And so we can then use um, this type of simulated um, <clears throat> birth data that's very tightly based on our field data um, to see whether our birth timing constrains the ability of foot and mouth disease to persist through acute transmission only. And so our what-if scenarios can include, you know, higher birth peaks, which would be equivalent to a larger population. We can change the timing so that our birth um, cohorts run closer together so that there's less of a gap, which should make it easier for the virus to persist, or we can have them move further apart and go through scenarios like that. Okay, so then death, um, our death parameter does not come from our current cohort study because um, our buffalo that we're studying right now are in a predator-free enclosure. Um, whoops, sorry. So um, these guys aren't there, and that really changes how mortality works in that group. We get some extraordinarily ge geriatric buffalo in that group. That would be very unusual in the wild. So instead, we're using data from Kruger Park, a previous cohort study that we ran there for four years, where we defined death in prime-aged animals. Um, in that study, we didn't ha have any babies or geriatrics, so we are, we are using data from another study in Shushlu and Pelosi Park to adjust our mortality parameters for very young and very old animals. And so the shape of the uh, mortality hazard function that we're using um, from these data looks like this, where death is relatively likely in uh, very young animals, then drops off and uh, in prime-aged animals, uh, death is quite unlikely. They have very good year-to-year -year survival. And then in the geriatric group, it um, goes back up again. Okay, maternal immunity. Um, <clears throat> currently still in our model, we have an absurd oversimplification of this term where we just assume that everybody loses maternal immunity after six months. Now, uh, you heard previously um, Catherine talk about that we are actively working on improving that parameter and we'll be using um, antibody data from our calves that we've been following now in the cohort study to define when maternal immu uh, immunity is actually lost and most importantly, what the variability of that is. So why this is so important is that if we have variable times at which maternal immunity is lost, then that effectively um, makes our birth pulse uh, wider in that you have your birth pulse and then on top of that you have more variation in maternal immunity loss um, so that those cohorts in terms of when they become susceptible move closer together. 
So we are working on that. It's complex data, and um, we will put it in the model as soon as we have a good answer for variation in that parameter. Okay, so where are we so far? We've used cohort studies, our current one and um, ones previously done, to define the birth parameter, which is really crucial, also the death parameter, and then defining maternal immune waning is in progress. So clearly, what we need to focus on next then is uh, transmission progression and recovery parameters, and we um, got those from our experimental um, infection uh, and that's, that's work mainly by uh, postdoc Erin Gorsuch and Simon Gubbins making those parameters. So just to remind you yet again, we did a challenge study, and this is only the acute infection piece here, not the um, uh, carrier piece that Ava talked about. We took four buffalo in each group, infected them um, with set one, two, or three, and as you can see, there really were fences in between, so much easier in a cartoon. Um, we then added some naive buffalo and allowed them to become infected by contact with um, our needle-infected animals. And then we watched on days 2, 4, 6, 8, 11, 14, and 30 um, what happened in the group. Uh, of course, the main question was, well, when did transmission actually occur? But we are measuring that indirectly through looking at viremia. And so the statistically interesting problem then is to infer the timing of infection from um, these data on viremia and, and potentially antibodies also. Um, so to reconstruct what actually happened in those BOMAs in terms of the spread of infection. So here again are the, the types of data we're using there. We are using viremia as an in indicator for infectiousness. You saw these data um, presented by Brie also. These show the averages of viremia in those BOMAs. So these are the needle infected and contact animals. Um, <clears throat> but when we look to reconstruct what happened in terms of transmission, we of course look at each individual animal and its profile of viremia over time. And so uh, some of you might have been in Simon Gubbin's talk yesterday um, where he explained a new Bayesian approach for inferring um, when transmission actually, actually occurred from exactly these types of data, and that's what he applied um, to these data also. And so the following graphs um, were made by Simon um, in, in trying to de define these, these parameters from the experimental data. Um, so what I'm showing here are graphs of the uh, inferred occurrences of infection in the BOMA. So all the uh, animals labeled I are the needle infected and the Cs are the contact animals. And then these are data for our SAT1, SAT2, and SAT3 separate BOMAs. Um, the blue indicates periods when those animals were viremic and assumed to be infectious. And that sort of tapers off towards the end as they become less viremic. Um, we, infer, we, we assume no latency for the needle-infected animals because the first time we measured them, they were all already viremic, so we have absolutely no evidence uh, for a needle infection there being any uh, kind of latency period. But for all three viruses, a model including a latency period, so an exposed class, fit the data better than models not including an exposed class. So for the contact animals here, what you see is the black dots in each case are the median inferred time point when, when basically our best guess is um, that infection occurred and the, the black bar around that is the range, the interportile range. And then the red shapes are the distributions, um, <clears throat> the likelihood distributions of when infection may have occurred. So the black dot is sort of the median of that probability distribution. And Things to note are that the viruses actually look quite different in terms of what happened in the BOMA, right? So SAT3 clearly um, has a longer latency period that fits those data best. So there's a delay here between when the animals likely became infected and, when, and became exposed, sorry, and when they themselves became infectious. Um, whereas SAT2 uh, is very, very consistent among individuals and very quick, uh, sorry, SAT1, and very quick. Uh, whereas SAT2 is sort of in between. There's a little bit of latency period, but not as long as SAT3, and it's a little bit more um, consistent among individuals. So you can then use those data, and by you I mean Simon can, um, to define these uh, important rates for our disease dynamic model. So the transmission rate, the latency period, and the infectious period, 
um, shown here for set one and green, set two and aqua, and set three and yellow. And in, in all cases, these are um, the statistical models that do include the latency period. Um, <clears throat> and what you see is that there are some differences here uh, between the viruses. Oh, sorry. And again, the, the dots are the median um, for the inferred parameter and the bar is the interquartile range. The colored blob is, again, the shape of the probability distribution for that parameter. So what you see is that there are some differences between the viruses and that the latency period is longer for SAT3 than the other two. Um, the infectious period is a little bit longer for SAT1 than the others. There's obviously overlap in those estimates, so whether one would call that significant, which is a bad word for Bayesians anyway, um, is, is unclear. But um, there's evidence that there are some, some differences among the viruses here. So that adds up then to um, differences in basic repro re reproductive number for, um, for the viruses. And so the basic reproductive number, R0, is sort of the epidemiologist's favorite friend um, because it is a good indication of the potential of an infection to spread, the speed of initial spread when an infection enters um, a population. And R0 is sort of this double-edged sword in the sense in that the higher R0 is, the faster the disease will tend to spread in a new population, but also the harder it is for that uh, infection to persist from year to year because it will more quickly run out of susceptible hosts. Okay, so just to recap here, we used our cohort studies to define birth, death, and in progress, uh, waning of maternal immunity. We then used our experimental study um, to define transmission, progression, and recovery parameters. And so <clears throat> what does that all mean for transmission dynamics of acute FMD in a buffalo herd? Well, so here are some modeling results uh, hot off the press. Um, what we did, and this time by we, I mean Jan, um, is use a herd size that's typical of a herd size in Kruger Park, a thousand buffalo, and we can vary that and play with it. Um, and we initiated runs at an equilibrium state, meaning that we didn't initiate at a naive population, we initiated at a typical buffalo population where most of the older animals would have been exposed already and would be immune at that point. Um, the colored lines here are uh, one run of the model. Um, each per line, and we did 100 in this case. And the black lines are the average number um, of animals in that group, sorry, not just infected, um, <clears throat> for, for runs where the infection hadn't gone extinct yet. So at the beginning, that is truly the average between all these lines. And towards the end there, it's just the average um, of those runs that still had infected animals in them, okay? So let's focus here. Well, okay, a couple of things. So maternal immunity, class goes up in all these cases because births are occurring. Um, susceptibles go down over time as the infection spreads, so that all makes sense. Exposed and then infected spikes and then peters out, um, and the recovered class um, sort of, because these numbers are quite small, stays more or less, more or less constant, even though some of the infecteds are recovering. But let's focus here on the infected group, which is really what we're interested in, in terms of this question where the, um, the infection can persist uh, based on acute transmission only. Um, and so what you see is that for all SATs, despite those differences in their speed of transmission, um, the infection peters out essentially between 30 and, you know, sort of 50 days maybe. Like this one here in SAT1 that that persists to over 50 days is just a single run, one out of 100 runs, manages to persist that long. Um, but so basically transmission through a susceptible calf cohort, um, according to these parameters that are all field derived, um, should last about 30 to 50 days. But the gap between birth cohorts is 150 days or more. Um, so FMDV, based on you know, the best data that, that are available to us to, to parameterize a thing like this um, is unlikely to persist by acute transmission alone. So in conclusion then, we used a combination of experimental and cohort studies to, uh, to give us estimates um, for parameters in our disease dynamic model. Uh, the model fit, the statistical model fit, was improved by including a latent period for all SAT viruses, but particularly important for SAT3. 
Um, latent period, infectious period, and transmission rate varied among SAT 1, 2, and 3, suggesting possibly different transmission dynamics. But for all of them, seasonal birth pulses are likely to limit the ability of FMD to persist by transmission during acute infection alone. However, there are some, some howevers there. We do have some work to do on this still. Um, <clears throat> most importantly, probably, um, to estimate that maternal waning parameter, which could broaden out um, the period during which susceptible animals are available and could change that picture somewhat. Then all of our parameters have uh, a, a median estimate, but also variance attached to them. And so we need to run a sensitivity analysis across those variable parameters um, to see whether anywhere in that parameter space um, there are combinations where um, FMD could, could persist um, through acute transmission only. And then, of course, we need to bring that circle back around and see whether what we're getting here from our, our disease dynamic model actually looks anything like what we see in the field where we have been following transmission events um, so that we can then look whether a typical annual um, pulse of transmission looks in nature like what we see in the model here. Uh, my thank you slide has those who are not authors already on the talk and our funders, uh, and we'll keep that ball rolling. Um, questions? Oh, thank you. Great talk. Um, do we know that maternal uh, antibody protects against foot and mouth infection? I mean, for example, we know in cattle that antibody doesn't protect against infection. It may protect against disease, but not infection. Uh, that's a really good question. I think um, we should be able to answer that with virus neutralization tests, but we have not done that. I think it would be a good idea to do so. Uh, just a... Uh, uh sort of a, perhaps a frivolous question, but um, you point out that your study group uh, is predator-free. Now, in, in Zimbabwe, uh, where I, I have some experience, the, the experienced conservationists tell us, uh, I don't know whether this is accurate or not, but they associate quite often foot and mouth disease outbreaks in cattle with lion activity. So maybe at the end of your experiment, maybe what, one thing you could do is introduce a couple of lions and see if it makes a difference. Yeah, our buffalo would all be really shocked and they, they're all hobbling around. They're not very fit, you know, they don't get to run very much. But actually, um, Alex Caron, um, a French researcher who's been doing research on the boundary um, of Kruger Park, uh, on, on the Zimbabwe boundary, um, just got some interesting data on that where also lion activity is associated with foot and mouth disease outbreaks. And I think his suggestion was, um, this is very secondhand, I'm, uh, just something we talked about, that buffalo um, get chased out more when there's lions on the boundary and therefore mix more with the cows rather than that lions are carrying the virus themselves. But so, so there's actually data there that sounds very much like what conservationists were telling you. So I was just wondering about the fact that um, whether buffalo can become susceptible after they've been infected. Do we have enough information about you know, how long maybe after infection they will be susceptible again and how that will impact on the model? Right, really good question, yeah. And um, so indeed that's one of our hypotheses for how the virus does persist because it clearly does so very well. Um, even though it's so fast in spreading through a calf cohort. So one of the hypotheses is that um, animals return to the susceptible group, perhaps because of viral evolution. So once the virus has changed enough after however many years um, that they're then susceptible again and become reinfected, which would boost your susceptible group and uh, also make the timing independent of the birth pulse of susceptibles becoming available. And so, yes, I think that's one mechanism that may very well be important um, for year-to-year -year persistence. It's that um, and or carriers playing a role. Before I left Honours Report, I was actually looking at some data, serology data, and you guys can look at it again. 
that um, even though we say that most adult buffaloes are, um, have antibodies, not all of them do. Yeah. So you may have these older animals that are fully susceptible anyway. So that as well, and, and um, actually that goes back to a question Brian was asking after Catherine's talk. So we do see these antibody drops even in old animals. Um, and so I think that, that antibodies are far more dynamic than what people have sort of assumed in the system. And I think much of that, uh, this is at this point a hunch, but it is driven by environmental factors in the sense that in our other infections that we measure, so we measure a whole bunch of respiratory viruses and bacterial infections, we also get these antibody drops and they're usually associated with the dry season. So I think that animals may well become susceptible again at times when they can't afford to make a lot of antibodies. And I think that'll probably be true for other infections as well as foot and mouth disease. As I was trying to imply earlier, the presence of antibody doesn't, not, doesn't mean they won't get infected. And of course you have three serotypes. Right. So I, I, are they ever non-susceptible? Well, I think they're non-susceptible to the particular thing they've seen before for some time. But, but that doesn't happen necessarily in cattle. You can still get infected by the same virus that, that you have antibody against. Well, so if right, virus Brian? neutralization is to be believed, then they're non-susceptible to something they've recently seen. But I think, I think that you know, we're measuring antibody, Nick, but um, well, we've got a measure of antibody, but we haven't done the experiment, but I would suspect if you infected an animal with a particular FMDV virus, it would be truly resistant to infection for a period of time afterwards. But not, maybe, maybe not very long. Our needle challenge, our, the original study that we published, I mean, I think probably a year as a minimum. Well, but, but we don't, don't we know in cattle that if, if they have um, antibody um, to a particular virus, you can still infect, they can still become infected with the same virus, I think, even. Depends how that, well, I think that depends how, you, how they um, became immune, I think, to infection. Mm. I, okay. I think you, they do become true. It's, it's been an interesting experiment to do. Right. Yeah. 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 But, you know, at the end of the day, that's a question that's really hard to answer experimentally because these are such long lived animals. So, you know, that's why I said long lived immunity is presumed in my intro slide because, of course, nobody's done the experiment of infecting a buffalo and then keeping it for many years and just retrying or at least re virus neutralizing. Um, so, you know, we don't know where the, the tail end of that immunity is. That's, that's certain. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so, now we leave Buffalo and move on.